back to Southeast in 2011. And um, something I really appreciate about her is that she understands um, data. Her business is called Raincoast Data, not surprising. And she really has a lot of understanding of, of how to do research on any topic really. And then where the um, where the resources are. So she doesn't know the answer. She knows where to find it. And that's what I tell people when, when I'm talking about Milani. I always tell them if she doesn't know what the answer is, she'll, she'll know how to find it. So, um, so she uh, has worked uh, with a lot of folks in the region through her business, but she's also just really well connected with leaders um, in Southeast. And so I think she's got a good beat on what's happening um, within our region and within the state and, and the world in general. So um, Melani, if you could just real quickly introduce yourself, uh, a little bit about who you are, what you do. Um, I think you also brought a guest and yeah, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay, well, thank you. And I'll, I'll just start by introducing my guest. I brought, we have a, a Alaska fellow um, who's now working for Southeast Conference. And so I brought Catherine Bell with me. I'm really excited to have her here. So she is here and listening in and participating. Um, so I am born and raised here in Southeast Alaska. I um, worked for a number of different organizations and sort of brought all of that together to Raincoast Data, a company I started seven years ago. And um, I'm, I'm sort of everybody's staff member. That's sort of what I feel like. I, I work for just organizations across Southeast. I try to stick with only Southeast. I'm doing some work in Valdez right now, but I, I pretty much say no to everybody else except for Southeast businesses and communities and nonprofits and organizations because I'm just obsessed and in love with Southeast Alaska. It's the best place in the world. It's the best place in the world to have a business. Like I, you know, it's the, the quality of life is, is just so incredible here that, um, you know, that that's, that's why I have my focus here. So I've got a master's of science um, with a specific focus in economics. And um, I, I, I do a number of projects um, across the region. I just, so um, just a couple of days ago, I got a new business license. So I've got Raincoast Data and I started Raincoast Fables. So I'm gonna do some not, I'm gonna do some fiction uh, publishing, <laughs> but very small, very small. That will be a very small thing. But anyway, there's my brief introduction. Thanks, Melani. Yeah, she is pub self-publishing her first book <laughs> soon. What's the title of the book? It's called Map Maker's Mistake. It's a children's novel. Yes, and I'm really excited because um, Milani has, an, um, she's very humble, I think, but she's a really uh, fascinating person and has, every time I talk to you, I'm like, what? Like, you have these fascinating stories. So I'm really excited to read this book and mostly for my daughter because I think she'll probably love it. Um, so check that out. Okay, so I'm going to get into our first question, Milani. First question I have for you is, um, can you tell us what are some of the main trends that we're seeing in changing markets? Yeah, so I'm going to start in this first question and probably the first half of the second question by depressing everybody. But the second half of the second question, I'm going to I'm going to give you some optimism again. So I just want to let you know it's coming like it, the good news is coming. Um, so what we've seen in in Southeast Alaska um, you know, we, we came into this year of COVID, this year of pandemic economy um, with, some, with some baggage, let's just put it that way. So we had some difficulties coming in. Number one really is um, continued loss of the government sector. So um, really state jobs. So if you look at the last eight years in Southeast Alaska, we have lost, um, we have lost 20% of all state jobs in the region. And so that's that's a loss of over a thousand state jobs. So that's that's a really big hit because these jobs are sort of the economic cornerstone of our region. And, and because of that, you see an associated population decline. We've had a population loss over the last five years. Um, e each of those years, a 3% population loss altogether. And we're also seeing loss in like state services. And I think the most significant one to Southeast that we see is that loss of ferry service. So even before we had the year of pandemic economy, we had we saw a loss of 50% in terms of ferry service, which, which I think impacts all of us greatly. Um, the other thing that happened in 2020 that had very little to do with the pandemic was our seafood season. So we are dealing with one of our worst seafood seasons ever. Um, we 
uh, er, the salmon, we're, we're still, you know, figuring out all of the numbers, but our salmon catch was down by 57%. So uh, just a tremendous loss in terms of um, total harvest. And, you know, our communities are really dependent on um, tourism and seafood. And so, and the state um, job sector. So to kind of get all of those, those um, sectors hit at the same time has been really hard. And so um, just thinking of that, we also, of course, are dealing with a pandemic economy. And this is not unique to Southeast Alaska, but in Southeast Alaska, we have been hit harder than most other people due to the configuration of those, those kind of different forces coming together. And also having that shorter um, seasonal tourism um, summer sector. So in Southeast Alaska altogether, if you look between April and September, we have lost 17% of our jobs. So that's a um, just a tremendous number, hard to wrap your head around. And um, it, it, we've been hit harder than any place else in Alaska. And really, I, I haven't done a sort of in-depth study by, by region in the United States, but I'm thinking that it makes us be one of the hardest hit places in, in the nation, um, again, because of that summer season. Um, we did a survey of business leaders across Southeast Alaska with about, I think, 460 um, business owners responded to our survey. And so we were able to not, it, it, it's, it's what you expect, but the visitor industry was the hardest hit um, in terms of lost revenue, followed by the arts sector, um, food and beverage service, transportation, um, and, but we do have some sectors that weren't hit at all. So like the mining sector um, has spent um, lots of money on COVID mitigation, but um, hasn't lost any jobs. And we've also saw a low level of job loss in our timber sector and actually in our Alaska native entities. I'm, I totally didn't look at when I started talking. So if you, if you let me know how many minutes I have left for the first question, but. Um, yeah, you're good. Okay. Yeah, just, just let me know because I forgot to look at the clock. And so, you know, and we asked business leaders too um, how they feel moving forward. And um, that we, according to this business survey, about a quarter of our businesses are our risk at clo of closing permanently. And we drilled a little bit more into that. We said, you know, who, who are you and where, do you, where are you living if you're concerned about closing permanently? And so the biggest impacts we saw about businesses that are concerned about being able to be viable in the long term are child care and social service organizations, food and beverage services, and the and tourism businesses. And um, least at risk were those in mining, financial services, timber, and Alaska Native entities. Those have the most positive outlook. And um, so there's just, you know, we're, we're in a really tough place right now in, in terms of our economy. Um, I just wanna say that the fundamentals of Southeast Alaska are still strong. We have just incredible people. We have incredible resources. We have so much to offer. Um, so this is where we are right now, but it's not where we're gonna stay. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably yeah. my five minutes. So I'll let you ask the second question. Yeah, no, that's great. And I know that you did get a large response on that survey. You said for over 400 um, respondents. And uh, I know you do annual business surveys, but that was um, the largest response you've received for any survey you've done of, of small businesses. Is that correct? No, it's, um, we've, we've had, an, we kind of, oh, okay. last year, it's, it's more than we had last year. Um, okay. I, you know, sometimes, I, I think because it was a more critical, I, I worked a little bit harder to, to do that outreach. Um, yeah. it, it just depends what we're going to do with the data, but I, I really worked hard to, to yeah. make sure that we got a good response rate on this one, but yeah. Um, well, so the second question then is getting a little deeper into tourism specifically. We have a few, well, quite a few um, businesses. I mean, at some level, every business is dependent on the tourism industry um, just because it brings in so much revenue and, and business. Um, but can you tell us what you do know about it and, and what we can expect in the next two years with tourism? Yes. So um, I think all of you probably heard that we're seeing some really um, useful information regarding the vaccines. So we've seen some vaccines with efficacy rate of 90 to 95%, which would be fantastic.
but um, the thing that they say about vaccines and 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 I I, I love the saying, but um, but vaccines don't um, don't help people. Um, vaccinations do, and so it's so we have this period of time where we're going to have a viable vaccine, but we're not going to have. Um, been able to have a large scale rollout plan yet. And just to go back and remind people, we're dealing with this economic crisis right now. This is not an economic crisis that's caused by economics. This is an economic crisis that's caused by a healthcare um, issue. And so the only way to get our economy back on track is to get our healthcare, um, the, the health of our communities back on track. And so the only way we're gonna do that is with a large scale rollout of the vaccine. And so um, there's, there's gonna be some rollout issues with that. And so we are not looking at having large scale um, access to the vaccine until the third quarter of 2021. That means we're looking at fall of next year, which means it's gonna be after the tourism season. So, this is not to say we're not going to have a tourism season. Um, we are right now the the tourism industry itself is planning to have about um, a half scale tourism season. So next year we were originally planning on 1.5 million cruise ship passengers coming to Southeast Alaska, and now we are planning on um, half that number. And um, it. If, if that's possible. Yeah. And, um, but what they're planning to do is to have these sort of bubble um, uh, uh, plan moving forward. And so that they're not gonna necessarily be coming to the shops in your community. They're not necessarily gonna be um, going on tours in your community, or if they go on tours, it's gonna be pre-planned um, uh, tour providers that are doing the really high level of mitigation that's required and maybe has half the um, the passengers that would or the participants that would normally come on those tours. So we're asking people to plan on about 30% of their revenue for 2021. And then also just have a plan in place where there where you get 0% of your revenue, not not because that's necessarily going to happen, but it could happen. And so I, I just encourage businesses, especially involved in the tourism industry, to have sort of three plans. Like one is, is a 30% revenue, one is a 0% revenue, and then one is we get a rollout much faster and, and we have a and we can actually have a season. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a tough, it's it's tough. It's so we're we're not um, we're not looking at the 20. 21 season being back on track yet. And that means that we're all going to have to like work to sustain our communities one more summer season um, without without the um, outside funding money rolling in from from the from the tourism and from the different sources. And so it's going to we're looking at a hard 2021. And then here's where I want to get back into the, the positive note. You know, once the economy does recover, once we do have a vaccine and we, we do expect the, the economy to come blazing back and there's going to be a lot of opportunities in Southeast Alaska, especially for entrepreneurs, especially in the visitor um, mm. sector because we're going to see, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing the loss of businesses, which is really hard. Um, but that means that, you know, eventually visitors are going to come back and eventually we're going to um, need to give them something to do when they come. And so there's going to be a lot of really interesting opportunities for entrepreneurship, for, for um, really being there to restart our economy. I also want to say I have seen some people in the visitor industry pivot to um, really um, kind of different and industry in, interesting types of um, opportunities um, given the current time. So Midgey Moore um, gives food tours, but now she's doing food boxes. Um, mm -hmm. So we just, uh, on behalf of my husband's company, I just ordered 80 Christmas boxes from her so, um, to send out to his, to his staff. And so that's, you know, um, being able to support Southeast Alaska organizations. So um, a little bit more about tourism sector. Um, there are a number of cruise ships that have been sold or um, 
re put on different routes outside of Alaska. Um, the one I think is most significant is the Moss Dam has been sold. And so that is was our sort of last remaining mid-sized cruise ship. So if you're in Wrangell or one of the communities that that maybe didn't have those large scale, the really large cruise ships coming to your city, but really depended on those the, that mid-size cruise ship range, the Moss Dam um, really represents a, a significant loss there. Um, we do still have those smaller cruise ships and, and maybe um, we'll um, build back that sector um, more in the future, given the um, how, how travel might change moving forward. So I don't know where I am on my timing, but I'll pause there and see. Yeah, well, that's great. And so, I mean, I have so many more questions and, you know, Mark, threw in a good, something I'm thinking about a lot too. Um, and we won't ask it right now, but I will say it's a great question to take into the breakout room with Melani. but that's sort of, uh, you know, once this is like a reset button on the industry really. And so once it comes back on, you know, what can we expect? What are, and I, I've been in a few of the um, industry calls on tourism and hearing there is some concern that they might not be coming back uh, the way they were before and, 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 and utilizing local cruise or excursions as much, or, or you know, um, yeah. it's a reset button for everyone. So I do think being really deliberate about our approach and like you said, um, looking at it as an opportunity and being ready for that, um, not being reactive to it, but being proactive. Um, so I'm sure there's a good discussion there with Melani if you wanna continue learning from her what she knows. And, and I do think um, being involved in that industry-wide discussion is really important. So for any of you that are interested in that, Milani definitely knows the who of the industry and how to connect you with that. So I'll leave that. Um, thank you so much, Milani. Um, and I'm gonna jump over now to Ian. So Ian Grant um, uh, works at AKSBDC and uh, he's been a, a supporter of Spruce Root since the very beginning, since before we were ever Spruce Root. Um, and he uh, brings a lot of um, expertise in working with entrepreneurs. He has been a business advisor um, in Southeast and worked with so many successful businesses here to help them put together business plans, financial projections. Uh, he's run his own businesses. And so he has a lot of knowledge um, and expertise in, in what it is to operate a business in Southeast Alaska. And so um, I'll just ask you, Ian, to briefly uh, introduce yourself and anything else you might want to add to who you are. Trying to look for him. Did we lose him? Uh-oh. I think we lost him just a minute ago. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Well, I'll, hopefully he'll come back on. Let's jump then to Mark. I see Mark is on. Mark Mesdag is another uh, very smart individual. I feel like I always want to call Mark when I have tons of questions. <laughs> about anything. Um, Mark works, uh, he's a CPA for LG Rayfeld Mertz and, and he's a partner. Um, and, uh, you know, Mark is, is kind of the go-to person for anything um, financial tax, you know, accounting related. Um, but he and LG Rayfeld have been working um, tirelessly since this whole pandemic started to be on top of all the different uh, CARES Act you know, regulations that have come out and navigating all of those funding opportunities um, for their uh, clients. And then, um, you know, just being that they really know like what's happening. And so whenever I'm not sure about something or not sure how to interpret the legislation or not how to sure, not sure how to interpret what to do next, um, I've been able to rely on Mark and his team to help me think through all that and answer some of my questions. Um, Mark, if you would just real briefly introduce yourself where you're at and and how are you doing today? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. It's uh, good to be here. It's, you know, these are always kind of confusing times. And yeah, no, we've, I've, I can't take all the credit. Of course, I have a very good team here at the office. There's, you know, I think there's 20 something of us now, but about 10, 15 of us that do tax and GL work. And I think um, I've never seen the team work so hard. I think everybody's tired, but just on a lot of back and forth, trying to interpret a lot of these issues that you were just mentioning. It's, there's not a lot of clear guidance and there's, I feel like we've all said, I don't know more than I've ever wanted to say um, in my career this year, but there's a lot of, I don't know, we have to kind of wait and see and we keep figuring things out as we go. But um, 
So I've been, uh, just a little bit about me, I've been born and raised here in Juneau, so this is a long time home. My family's been here for a long time. Um, so we moved away for, uh, for college for about eight years um, and eventually found our way back up here. It's fourth and done, we never come back to Juneau and then convinced my wife finally to come back. And yeah, she said three to five years we'd be here and then that was 10 years ago and now she never wants to leave. So we're pretty committed here. We love being back and um, love getting out with the kids. So yeah, and then I've been doing this job here. I became a partner about five years ago in LG Rayfield, but I've been doing this cut line of work for, for 12 years now, I think. So I've been doing it a while. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Well, appreciate you being here today. So the first question I have for you, if you could tell us, um, you know, if I am a business owner and I took out a PPP or an idle loan or some other federal CARES Act, maybe through my municipality, um, what should I do to be best preparing myself come tax time uh, in April? You know, that's a good question. And I feel like I get this question probably daily. You know, I feel like I answer this a couple times a week. Um, so right now it's kind of broken down into a couple of different groups of uh, types of funding. So I think as you mentioned in the, what you emailed me originally was, you know, you got PPP funding, you got the EIDL, and then you have just sort of all the other grants. And that can be um, various municipalities have done things differently. They've done local grants for like CBJ has done a lot of local grants. Um, you got the CARES Act or the, um, uh, or the CARES funding through the state, or and which was the Alaska CARES, and that was a whole different ball game. And so a lot of people got that, um, but a lot of people didn't. You know, so it just it, everybody got a, a whole blend of a whole bunch of things. And I have a lot of people that ended up with a whole bunch of it that all just came through pretty recently, and now they're having to go back through and identify okay, make sure they have all the funding sources um, for spending it. So kind of thinking it through, you kind of have to break those up in your own head and say, okay, let's tackle one at a time. Um, the PPP funding for those that got that, you know, that was obviously meant really geared towards payroll, right? That was geared towards um, trying to keep people employed for a set period of time. And so if you have gotten that, you should be looking at your forgiveness um, now to try to see what, what you may or may not be eligible for. But um, most people are going to be eligible for forgiveness, right? They got the money and they got, um, we'll get forgiveness. They just came out fairly recently that anything under 50,000 is practically automatically forgiven. Um, so it's a pretty, there's a simplified form for that one. So if you have less than a 50,000 PPP, forgiveness should be pretty straightforward. If you're over 50,000, there's still a little bit more of a convoluted process for the application that you have to go through. Um, but the best thing to do is, you know, contact somebody like one of us or look through the bank, really just start working through that process. Um, but I can break it down to a couple different groups of people. If you're a sole proprietor and it's just you with no employees, then I would, you know, there's no real reason to wait. You can start on that forgiveness process. Now, if you're a nonprofit, again, no real reason to wait because there's no tax impact. But if you're really any other business and you have employees, it might be beneficial. Kind of the current guidance that we have right now is to wait until 2021 to finish, finish processing that application for forgiveness. And the reason being, is when this came out, the Congress basically said that, yep, no, this is non-taxable. So the forgiveness piece of it, you know, normally when you have loan forgiveness, that's a taxable event where it's going to be taxable income to you. However, they specifically called this out and said, no, but PPP forgiveness will not be taxable. And then the IRS through their interpretation said, yeah, that may not be taxable, but the expenses associated with that forgiveness, so you can't have not deductible expenses for when you have non-deductible or um, tax-free income. And so all of a sudden, all those deductions that you use that money on become non-deductible, basically making this whole thing taxable um, is the way that it'll end up. It comes down on the bottom line of your financials exactly the same. So right now, Congress has, has indicated, and it seems to have a lot of support on both sides of the aisle, that that wasn't their intent, and they do want to come back and make the whole thing tax-free. But again, that hasn't been done yet, and so until it's done, I don't believe it. So in, Right now, I'm planning on that being taxable, um, effectively taxable. However, one of the latest bit of guidance has kind of come out in interpretation saying, well, if there's an issue with timing, because you don't have to have uh, forgiveness now in 2020, you could have it in 2021. And if you get that forgiveness in 21, then you may not have non deductible expenses in that year, right? Because they were all incurred in 2020. So there might be a timing issue here that we can take advantage of. Um, 
I don't know if it's going to work yet. Um, waiting kind of for feedback on the SBA. Hopefully they'll release some more FAQs to say yes or no on the, or the, really the IRS not the SBA on that one. But so right now, what I've been telling people is hit submit on the forgiveness if you have employees um, in 2021, and so that way we can hopefully potentially get a better tax impact. Um, the rest of them are going to be pretty straightforward. You know, the PPP is the most confusing because it has these tax impacts depending on how you handle it. All of the other grants that you get, you know, your local municipality grants, your Alaska CARES grant, I mean, all of those grants are grants and they're taxable. So unless something says that it's not taxable, you have to plan on it being taxable. So those are all going to get added to your taxable gross revenue. And so what I've told people to do is on there, whatever they're using for their accounting is identify those individually. Um, so that way, when we do get the tax time, we can really easily identify them and we know, okay, you know, hopefully by that point, we'll have more guidance if there's a different treatment. But otherwise, we're going to include it in gross income. If we can do something different, you know, we'll hopefully know more later. Um, the one thing with the EIDL that people should be aware of is if you did get that, it's, you know, again, it's a loan and you're going to have to pay it back. So there's no real tax consequence there, except for if you get the EIDL advance, so that, that $10,000 or up to $10,000 that you could get out the gate. If you got that, that's going to in turn reduce any PPP forgiveness that you have. So if you were eligible for $100,000 PPP forgiveness, for let's say, and you got a $10,000 advance, your PPP forgiveness is actually going to get reduced to $9,000, $90,000, and that $10,000 is going to be a tax as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just learned a few important things, so I'm sure other people did too. Um, and this is very confusing to navigate. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, if if you're still feeling lost, don't worry. It is not something that when you sign up to be an entrepreneur, you should expect to have to do. I, at Spruce Root, we are a nonprofit and we write grants and we manage various funders and all of this. And that's a whole skill set that um, if you're just running a business as an entrepreneur, you're not necessarily set up to be doing. So if you feel lost about all of it, don't worry, you're not alone. Um, so my second question then for you is a bit more broad, kind of taking it away from the COVID and PPP stuff, but, uh, you know, feel free to answer as, as, as you want, but kind of curious what you see are common financial management mistakes that entrepreneurs are making, uh, just in general. And, you know, this is a group of entrepreneurs that have all been in business for at least a year or more. And are this morning, a lot of them had mentioned, you know, I've never really put together a business plan. I've never sat down and like thought through my financials. And so as a CPA, someone that works with a lot of entrepreneurs, what's what's some advice you might have for them? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there were two things that kind of jumped into my head when I first saw this question of what are the most common things? Because I mean, I can give an array of just different things I see in different businesses, but probably the, there's two things that jump out at me. And one, and again, I don't want this to be a self-serving comment, but is that not seeking advice from professionals or not taking the advice given by professionals. Um, it's very common that, you know, we, what we call here in the office is sometimes we have to move the bullseye to hit the target. And so, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times after the a transaction has occurred or a contract's been written, or um, I mean, I can tell you one this summer that we've had to work with an attorney to completely, I mean, I don't know how much more time we have to put into it because they didn't want to use an attorney and they came out with their own partnership agreement together and then their own, you know, agreements. And there was stuff that violated state law in there. I mean, it was just it yeah. ends up costing a whole lot more to go back and fix it. So I think one of the, probably the biggest things is not being afraid to seek advice from professionals. I think the cost to not ask the question can be a lot more, um, a lot more expensive than just, you know, coming out the gate. Um, it can be a lot, lot less time in everybody's hands for me to take 10, 15 minutes to review something sometimes is all it takes, or to even just tell you over the phone, oh no, we have nothing to worry about what you're doing is fine. Or, or it's a whole time out. Wait a second, we need to backtrack take these things out. If you do this, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I think there's a reason why, you know, you know, we get so busy. I mean, it's just, uh, as you indicated, the, the world's complicated and the rules are extremely complex and it's easy to get yourself in a bind in a hurry and not even mean to. So, um, you know, it's, again, it's a lot easier doing things a little yeah. more expensive and when you think about it at the gate to try to do those, but at the same time, um, it can be a lot less costly than what, you know, bad ramifications from a bad bad decision that you didn't know that was gonna have a negative tax impact or just legal impact or whatever it may be. So I think one of them is right. seeking professionals when you're not sure, um, you know, and not being afraid to, you know, for phone calls or emails or just touching base, you know, that's kind of mm -hmm. what we're doing for advisors. 
The other one that I see a lot of is really, I mean, and again, coming from a CPA, of course, you're going to hear this, but of clients not being aware of what their financial picture looks like and they're, um, I guess, not watching their expenses. They think they're making a lot more money than they are, you know, because they see the gross mm-hmm. and the invoices coming out, but they don't understand the cost, you know, on the expenses going out the door. So a lot of just trying to find an accounting system that works for you um, and your business. And what I, I tell people a lot of times too, is that, you know, I, when I say that, I'm not meaning jumping into a complex accounting system. You know, QuickBooks is, and accounting systems are great. They serve a purpose, but they're a tool. Um, and if you put a tool in the hands of somebody that doesn't know how to use it, it's not a very effective tool. You know, I don't know how to build a house. And so handing me a skill saw and a table saw and all the tools to build a house doesn't mean I can go build a house. You know, so um, a lot of times I sat down with people and walked them through just how to use Excel, right? Just entering expenses into Excel, mm-hmm. how to track their bank accounts forward and reconcile their bank accounts monthly and just do some basic functions so they can see where their money's going. You know, they should know kind of what the break even point is. You know, how much money do you have to come, have coming in to pay your bills? You know, what's your minimum? So I think just understanding some of those basic accounting principles, but you don't need to get complex with it. We can keep it simple and something that works for you. A, a, a system that's overly sophisticated becomes um, just as not, you know, just as useless as not having one at all. So, Absolutely. Yeah, those are two really great um, pieces of advice. And I, I agree. You know, I think financial management is such a tough and complex skill to have. And most of us come into entrepreneurship through some other skill that we have, right? Like we, we build a product or we offer a service. And so the financial management piece is sort of an afterthought that we're like, oh yeah, now I have to do this. Now that I'm running a business, I have to kind of plan. So we approach it oftentimes being a little afraid and, and hesitant and don't know what we're doing. And that fear can usually be what stops us from reaching out to someone like yourself. So I appreciate that advice. And I do encourage anyone um, that has more questions uh, for Mark to, you know, join with, join him in that breakout session after this, or, you know, I'm sure you could follow up with him one-on-one. Um, I, I will say that I, it is in all those little transactions that you realize, oh, shoot, I should have, I didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. And so um, I've asked Mark, you know, for, I was thinking about selling a business and before I got even deep into knowing what that meant or how to do it, I, ca- I gave him a call and said, what should I be thinking about? And so he helped me back up a few steps because I was a little, you know, I was thinking about the wrong stuff and, um, or things that I hadn't thought about, he was able to bring, bring, shed some light on. And I think each of you were talking about your exit strategy. And, um, and a lot of you said, you know, I never even had thought about that. So this is a good reason why, because you want to financially plan for aligning your business with whatever your exit strategy is. And we don't do that typically as entrepreneurs. We don't really think about that until it's time. So he can also offer a lot of advice um, to that. So thank you so much, Mark. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next person. Uh, Ian, are you back with us? Yeah, sorry, we lost power there for a second. I was, oh, yeah. I don't know what it was. Oh. It was perfect timing. Well, I gave a really amazing intro that you oh, missed, great. but you're just gonna have to believe it. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this is Ian Grant with AKSPDC, as I mentioned before. So I'll just ask you, Ian, before I jump into your questions, if you will just give a brief introduction of who you are and what you do. Sure, uh, well, so my name's Ian Grant. Um, I'm currently the director of the Juno Center here for the Small Business Development Center. Um, I've, I've been here doing this since I think 2010. Um, I, I've served a few different roles here at the organization, done some rural work and some state work, and but now I'm um, only working with Juno businesses. So um, I run the Juno Center where we, we're a nonprofit. We provide 100% free um, business advising to folks uh, who, and really those topics can range from anything from starting a business, buying, selling, um, and so I'm constantly working with business owners. And usually it's, it starts with just the business plan and getting things started and working on um, building different aspects over the years and maybe focusing on marketing or operations and eventually, uh, hopefully that exit strategy. So there's you know, some businesses that have been clients for 10, 11 years now and some people come and go um, just for their, the, the basic needs that they're looking for. Like we went through a lot of prepping people for the PPP and EIDL and helping everybody get prepared. But um, so yeah, I've been doing this for, I, I love doing the work. I love helping people uh, figure out the puzzles that are that are out there trying to make our businesses successful. And I hope to be doing this for a long time coming. So. 
Awesome. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. And so, like I mentioned before, Ian's worked with a lot of entrepreneurs around Southeast. So I think he brings a perspective that's unique because he has seen a lot of, a lot of different issues and can bring, um, bring that perspective into working with every entrepreneur. Right. And, and so oftentimes as entrepreneurs, we're focused in our niche or our business, but he's got this broader view, um, which is really awesome. And, uh, and yeah, he, I think brings a lot of that motivation to work with other entrepreneurs. Um, which I, I share that with you, you know, it's, it's so like, it gives you so much, um, value to, uh, work with other entrepreneurs and see them succeed and know that you are able to like have a piece of that, like be a tiny part of that. I know it can be really fulfilling because entrepreneurship is just such an amazing thing. And so, um, given all your knowledge in entrepreneurship and working with different entrepreneurs, the first question I have for you is what is the most common issue that you see faced by owners who are attempting to sell their business, um, you know, and, and what does that look like typically in your experience? Yeah, sure. And this is, and there, there's a lot of this now. There's a lot of people transitioning, um, selling, or you know, those young, um, those young employees taking on the role of hopefully becoming those leaders. So we're doing a lot of this right now. Um, it mm -hmm. um, this is a perfect time period. And so, I mean, for me, the most common uh, issues that are out there for someone looking to sell the business are really, you can kind of break them down into two different categories, right? Um, one of them being, um, how do we expedite the sale? Because what's gonna happen typically is owners aren't prepared for that entire process. So there's a lot that we can resolve um, if, if the owner understands that process, right? Um, and so part of it is expediting that sale. And I think then the other part is how do we maximize the profits from that sale, right? Um, so before I like dig into those just a little bit, um, it's, I think it's beneficial for every business owner, if they're looking at selling their business and creating that ex exit strategy is to, is to shift your perspective and start thinking in terms of what the buyer will be going through when they're looking at the business and all that's going to go into that process. Um, because that's where the owners seem to get caught off guard and things start to take longer. Right. Um, so if, if we start by um, understanding what a buyer will go through when they're looking at financing that business, that purchase, that's where we can find all those steps to really expedite everything, maximize the profits and simplify everything, um, right? And so, and I say, I'm looking at getting financing for the purchase because the, over the last 11 years now, 99% of the business purchases that happen are going to be through typical financing where you're working with a local lender, right? I'm rarely do I see um, anybody purchasing a business coming in and, and doing so from a cash position, right? So we're always looking yeah. at financing. And, and to me, this is the main, this is where owners um, sometimes feel a little, a little almost violated with all the questions that are asked about the financials and what they have to turn over. They're just not prepared for that. And so there's a lot of confusion that happens. Um, so I think if, if, if as an owner, you understand there's a few main phases that you're gonna have to, that a buyer would be going through, um, then you can simplify this, right? Um, so one of those phases that people are gonna go through, and this is the one that creates, for me, that I see the most bottlenecks, um, which is the period of what's called due diligence. And if, all this means basically is the, um, the buyer is gonna have to go through they're going to be looking at tax returns and financial statements and trying to right, validate the purchase price and get a loan scenario together. Um, and by going through that period of due diligence, then they're going to be creating projections for the bank, which are showing a financial forecast on how the business can carry this new loan for the purchase while also existing all um, current um, responsibilities. And then the last one is going to be that writing of the business plan, right? Where they're mapping out the story for the bank of why this purchase makes sense and how they're going to make it just as successful as the current um, owners have done. And so um, for that due diligence period, um, I like to think of this as like um, any owner that would come to us and they're seeking to sell, I try and create a loan package for them right away. Right. And so in that loan package, the first thing we're getting, we're getting everything ready for due diligence, right? So that's getting three to six years of tax returns ready, getting all balance sheets and income statements ready and current inventory. And sometimes that step alone 
owners don't have all that prepared, right? So you're having to reach out to Rayfield Mertz. You're having to get your, your statements and your tax returns and everything ready that I don't, maybe current taxes aren't done or you don't, you know, you haven't been keeping up with the bookkeeping. There's lots of things that happen here that um, one, create some bottlenecks and two, this is where I see owners getting a little frustrated because they're sharing information, right? That's, that's personal to them and their business. And this is where we also want to recommend you, you get a non-disclosure agreement. And basically what that will mean is we sign this agreement that says the potential buyers aren't going to be sharing any, any of that financial information that's being turned over. And so this, this, that area is where I see the most problems because um, a, a business owner wants some kind of commitment on the purchase before they're willing to turn over that information. But a potential mm -hmm. buyer can't give you any type of a commitment until they have a chance to review that information. So that's why getting that non-disclosure ready and, and working to have your financial statements ready and your tax returns ready, that's gonna expedite everything drastically. That's usually the number one bottleneck, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that kind of leads us to the second part of this is creating those three to five year projections. Because you have to understand that when a buyer is coming in for financing, they have to take all of that information that you have and create a three year model, three to five year model for the bank that shows the future outlook based on all your past performance and how this new loan can be carried with all the business financials, right? With all that performance. So again, having all that information ready and um, um, and solid data from your bookkeepers is going to help the buyer then put that loan packet, part of that loan package together, which is of course where you're going to expedite that process. Um, and then I guess the, the last part of that is if, if we get to that phase where they've the projections look great, we can, it, it satisfies the, the purchase price, we can carry that debt, then they're writing the business plan as the last phase, right? So those are the to me, those are the main chunks that um, that are often taking the most time when somebody's preparing for sale that create all the issues. And so, I, I mean, the, the best thing, honestly, that you can do as a business owner when you're putting that package together is getting getting your that due diligence package ready. Um, and you yourself can work with advisors like like myself and others out there to create a projection model so you can see what a buyer would be looking at. And this is one, and the, the one that always takes the most time is the business plan. Mm -hmm. um, most business owners that I work with do not have a current business plan, right? Um, often um, owners maybe have been thinking about selling over the past few years, maybe they start kicking the idea around. And then it just ends up this one day where they're like, okay, like, like that's it right now now's the time to sell and that's usually like the worst time to do it right that you and this is where we're getting into that exit strategy but um the so the best thing you can do when you're preparing here is i'd write a current business plan yourself have that package ready if you have your due diligence package ready with all your financial statements you've got a projection model set from your current performance and you yourself write a current business plan that cuts down months and i and i mean months of work on the buyer side because I'm, I'm constantly working with clients who are purchasing businesses right or selling and those that are purchasing when they're putting those plans together and projections together they're constantly coming at you the the owners for all of that information they're trying to write this plan from scratch understand your marketing your operations they're trying to map all that out to make that solid story for the bank right so if you as an owner can put that current plan together, you're, you're going to expedite those steps into, um, into getting those qualified buyers done, right? So that, that all goes into, I think you can group that into expediting the process, preparing everything for that loan package. That's going to help you tremendously save lots of heartache. You're going to get to the um, qualified buyer much quicker, right? Um, mm -hmm. And with all that, uh, I guess the last part of that then is just maximizing the profits. And that, that kind of ties into um, that one day just being done. Um, because what you can, if you're thinking in terms of that buyer, um, they need to show that this business can carry the loan, right? That they can satisfy that price that you want, that you've worked hard for all those years, right? You've put all those blood, sweat, and tears in. And so what I see happen often is over the years, uh, a business owner 
you know, they finally are pulling away from the business a little bit. They maybe have more employees working, which is reducing cash flow. Maybe they stop working with vendors as much on better purchasing power. So they're not keeping up with getting the best prices. So, you know, increasing expenses. And so all of or not checking, not keeping updated marketing plans or simple things like uh, credit card processing fees, right? Like just the, the little things that as a fresh business owner is constantly working at trying to solve that higher cash flow issue. Owners on the opposite end are kind of letting that go. And if you as an owner try to sell it that one day you just done, you're going to sell, that's probably the worst time to to hand that to a buyer who's going to a bank. It's going to hurt your sales price. It's going to hurt that ability to, um, to carry that debt. So, you know, that exit strategy, just understanding that whole process so you can expedite and maximize the profits. That's, those are the, the two big areas, right? Expediting and maximizing profits to me. That, that's a common one. Yeah, that's so great. And, um, you know, so we had asked them all to think about their exit strategy this morning. That was one of the prompts. And a lot of folks said, you know, hadn't even thought about that. And mostly because these are people that are either newer to business or, you know, they're in, they're in a stage where they're not trying to get out. Um, and so the question of exit strategy is in front of mind. And so we um, purposely, you know, push them to think about that because it is, it is so important to set your business up um, to get to wherever it is you're trying to go. So not everyone is going to want to sell. Um, you may not have the interest or desire. You might not really have a business that's sellable if, if, if you're doing something that really requires you and your expertise, right? Um, so there are different types of exit strategies. It's not all about selling a business, but I do think that whatever your exit strategy is, you need to plan now for your, to be in the best position when that time comes. And so the, I guess the last question, if you have anything else to add, cause you started to answer this, but you know, how can business owners begin to create that exit strategy um, wherever they're at in the stage of, of their business life cycle? Sure. Yeah. And it, I think the, well, one, um, I'd recommend you reach out. Uh, I My center and all centers throughout Alaska are happy to help folks do this. Um, uh, to me, it's um, understanding personal goals um, from begin whether you're entering the business or exiting the business. And, and like you said, some people might be selling Others might um, have a, a target nest egg or whatever that is, and then they're happy to either pass it on or to shut down the business. But um, I think what helps is if, if you reach out to an advisor here at the SPDC, I know this is something that I, I'm doing with folks right now, where I'll help you put together that loan package I, with the financial statements that you can, that you provide to me. Um, I will give you a financial forecast. We can do it in about an hour, maybe hour and a half. Um, I'll, I'll take care of it for you. And so before you, you put the business for sale or decide to close down, um, you can take a look at that model and see where we're projected to go if we continue operating how we are right now, and then start looking at some of those goals. Is it a, is it a sales price? Is it that nest egg that we're looking for or reducing the amount of hours? Whatever um, those big life goals, right? The three to five year goals are, we can take a look to see what it's going to take to help get you there, right? Um, and that can whether it's maximizing profits and helping you work with um, getting the financials in a, in, in a situation that'll look um, great to a lender. Um, mm -hmm. We can help you do that. So we know that, okay, if it takes about two years to get us to where we want to be, well, then we've got a plan for the next two years, right? And we can write a business plan to do that. So um, I encourage you, even if you're, uh, if you're not sure and you're thinking maybe over the next three to five years, you might be exiting, reach out, um, reach out to myself or uh, any of the advisors here and we'll be happy to put that together for you and work with you on just evaluating some of those goals and doing those what if scenarios so that you're, you're equipped with the knowledge so you can make an informed decision. And yeah, plan ahead. Awesome. Even, even if you're not sure yeah. yet, plan ahead and, and work with somebody that's, um, I think working with an advisor like myself or um, anybody at Spruce Root um, you, you get uh, you get a third party who's not emotionally involved and they can give you a great perspective on how to put one of those plans together. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And like Ian said, he's in Juno and focuses on Juno, but we have um, an AKSBDC advisor in Ketchikan. You have another f person in Juno that serves other communities in Southeast. And this is a statewide organization and um, they've got some great resources on their website. So uh, yeah, certainly um, encourage you to, to check out AKSBDC if you haven't already. And then 
we do at Spruce Root also offer business advising and both our organizations work um, in partnership. And so usually if, you know, you're not feeling like the one is quite for you, we usually encourage you to go over to the other one and, and you know, either way, you're going to find an advisor that can help you. Um, but, but you're so right in the, the, if you're not quite sure what you want to do, that's the perfect time to reach out and then exactly. figure it out. Um, if you're not sure, that's when you need to figure it out. Um, so thank you, Ian. I, I've, um, I'm sure there's a lot more questions folks have for you. And then um, our last person I'll uh, maybe give a little less time to because I can because she works for Spruce <laughs> uh, is Caprice Pratt. And uh, Caprice is our loan underwriter at Spruce Root. She has a wealth of experience um, in different industries, which she brings to the work that she does for us. And man, I just think whenever I don't know something about a business or a loan, if I ask Caprice, she has a past experience that lends to figuring it out. Um, and so she, yeah, she's, she's kind of a jack of all trades and um, I'll let you Caprice introduce yourself real quickly. Okay. Hi everybody. Thanks for being here. And uh, Elena's right. I, I feel like I should be 150 years old with my background. Um, I, I have been blessed with a variety of industries and uh, it ranges from retail sales to IT to ocean going transportation to the timber industry, traditional banking and lending, seafood sales. I worked for the federal government and the state government at one point in my life. And my husband and I like to fabricate hot rods in our spare time. And we've put together over two dozen of them in, in the spare time that we've been together in the last 15 years. So I'm a busy lady with a lot of interests and all of these things culminated into this great position I, I got with Elena and the team um, back in 2016 here at Spruce Root. Um, and my, my primary focus is underwriting loans. And what that is in, in a nutshell is when somebody is ready to do a loan type product, I investigate and analyze everything that's been turned in, ask a lot of questions and try to get it to a point where whoever is asking, we can, we can set them up for the most success, much like what, what Ian is doing. Um, and so I, I really love what I do, where I do it. And I've got over 40 years of business experience, 30 plus of them all in Sitka and Southeast. Um, so I'm pretty well-rounded. Uh, it sounds like I should be really old and that I was a job hopper, but I wasn't. I'm just, <laughs> yeah. I'm just old. <laughs> Very dedicated. Um, so Caprice, thank you. Our, the first question I have for you, given all of that and, and what you're doing now in your role as an underwriter for Spruce Root is what are some things that as an entrepreneur we can um, plan for financially that maybe aren't as obvious that people don't always think about? Well, I, um, in thinking through uh, the questions, I, you know, we kind of had a heads up. Um, it's not that you wouldn't have thought of them, but I, I'd like to go over some things that you should think of if you haven't already. Um, one is re you reduce your risk by planning. Um, have plan A, B, C, and hopefully D ready to go when you need it. Um, and, I, and I put a note in here for myself to use my concrete pouring as an example. My husband and I recently poured 10 yards of concrete. It waits for nobody, much like the economy and your customers and your business are going to wait for nobody. So make sure that you, you've you thought it through um, because you may not have time to react. The more pro thought you can give to something makes that outcome that much easier. Um, uh, evaluate your budget and create up-to-date cash flow statements and with projections. Um, what uh, Ashley has provided here for you is actually a spreadsheet that I helped her develop um, with all of the things that I look at and all those questions I ask. They may, uh, everything on there may not apply to your business, but I want you to ask the questions for yourself. You need to know those things. Um, and don't, don't make the financial thing seem like a scary thing. Uh, you've got tons of resources in and out of Spruce Root that can help you with those things. There's a reason you have a business and I have a business degree. Two very different things. So uh, use us. Um, I highly recommend, and this comes from back in my banking days, is underestimating your revenue. Seems like everybody always wants to go, oh, I'm going to make a billion dollars. And overestimating your expenses. Oh, it'll, 
cost me nothing. Um, be sure to, to really take a hard, fast look at that. Don't look at it from best case rosy scenario. Look at it from where I'm going to look at it from is what if everything goes wrong? And it used to be everybody used to tell me, oh, that'll never happen. Hey, entered 2020, everything happened. And I'm afraid to even guess what may come. So we're not going to go there, but overestimate expenses, underestimate your revenue. Um, and then really evaluate your revenue streams. What are your options? You know, everybody's talking about pivoting in this world. Um, there are there are opportunities out there. Wherever a door gets shut, a door a window gets opened. So be sure to really vet that out and see if there's something else you can do. You know, is is there a need in your community that's not being met? Um, I bet you there is. And if you can't find it on your own, ask a friend. Ask us. Uh, you know, at, just use your network to the best of your ability to try to find ways to get you through this. Um, scrutinize your expenses. Where can you save money? Uh, don't assume anything. Can you, can you save on insurance? Call your insurance broker. Um, can you save on your utilities? Get in touch with whoever provides your utilities. You know, in some cases, the private industry, some cases, it's a municipality. Um, can you work with another business in your area to consolidate freight? Uh, there are there are always ways to think outside the box, so to speak, and, and go for something that's unconventional. Um, you don't have to stay within a set standard. That's the beauty of being an American. You can do things you want to do. Um, and then if you see issues with cash flow, and and in a nutshell, for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, it's it's the amount of money that's coming in and the amount of money that's going out every month. A lot of people assume that that's going to be stagnant and it's always going to look the same. It doesn't. And oftentimes it doesn't in Southeast Alaska because we typically have a season where we're, we're heavy on income and then we go through a, a dead season. Um, it, it is more pronounced in Southeast. So look at where those holes are and try to determine what your financing, op financing options are now. You, you, Maybe you'll go through your cash flow and go, nope, I'm, I'm good. I won't need anything. Um, but if, you, if you're thinking you may need it, now is the time to reach out to people like Spruce Root, to Ian, um, to anybody in your network that may be able to help you, whether it's private financers and or traditional financers, ask those questions now while you have cash. The biggest mistake I saw when I worked in banking is people would wait until they were in a very poor financial position to come forward and say, hey, I need help. Um, that's not the time to do it because sadly, the way it's written, you're gonna be denied. So be proactive, think things through and, and do your best to, to get those questions answered now before you actually need those answers. Great. Um, and then I guess the next question, uh, I'm losing my, oh, uh, really briefly is, um, what are the strategies for building a financial advisory team, right? Like if, if I'm an, a person that, especially a person that doesn't really feel strong about understanding the financial side of my business or how to manage that, um, what, what recommendations do you have there? Well, I, I actually have several and, and, uh, not just on the financial front, um, this is the big chance you as an entrepreneur have for building your work family. And it is one of the things I ask when I'm doing my underwriting is, is who is in that financial family? Who is in your work family? And I'm not talking employees most of the time. Um, you, you really should have a good relationship with your banker. Even if your banker isn't able to give you the kind of financing help you need, you need to know and love and trust your banker. Um, they can help you through a myriad of problems. They can also help you be proactive. Um, back to uh, uh, LG Rayfeld, get an accountant. I cannot tell you how many times I have talked to people in the construction industry, the electrician industry, uh, the fishing industry. Oh, I don't have money for an accountant. You don't have money to not have an accountant. I can't stress that enough. It doesn't mean you have to spend a fortune. And, and as Mr. Mezdag pointed out, it's, it's, uh, it, it depends on what your business is, but you really need to have somebody that understands that world, give you some direction, point you in the right direction, 
and and they know that you can't afford a, a full-time accountant i mean heck spruce root we're we're doing pretty decent for ourselves we don't have a full-time accountant um you know it, it's become a big team uh don't underestimate the value of hiring the right people for the right job um, same thing with an attorney, uh, sp specifically one that is experienced in small business, uh, even better if they can be a tax advisor. Um, the time to find one of them is not in the future when you need one. You will be desperate. Find a, a good attorney now, get a relationship started. It doesn't cost a fortune, and in the long term, uh, it will save you money. Insurance, proper coverage, long-term savings come from proper coverage. If you are overcovered, bad thing. If you're undercovered, bad thing. The only person that can help you with that is who you trust with your insurance to begin with. They are more than happy to help. They understand where you're coming from and they should know you as a person. Um, also in terms of coaching, uh, as this whole panel has pointed out, there's tons of free resources out there. I never knew about them, you know, even 20 years ago. Um, take advantage of these. Uh, if, if one of them can't help you, they can most certainly refer you to somebody that can. And we're, assume the best. We all want you to be successful. That's why we're here. It's, mm -hmm. it's not because my paycheck depends on it. It's because I want to see you be successful. There's a certain sense of pride that comes from, from going, oh, I, I help them or... I know them or look at how they're doing, you know, it, it, it really is rewarding. And then finally, last but not least, um, is your fellow entrepreneurs and peer advisors. This is a magnificent opportunity here today for you to get to know all of these people in the region. And we, I think as business owners in general, you tend to want to keep your, your cards close at hand. It's like, oh, I don't want anybody knowing what I'm doing. But we're kind of unique in Southeast, you know, a, a restaurant tour in Sitka is not going to have any impact on a restaurant tour in Yakutat. Um, you guys are getting to meet a wealth of people throughout the region. I encourage you to use those resources, get together, talk. Uh, I can't tell you how important some of these Zoom meetings have been for both staff inside and outside of our organization. Um, it's good to connect with people that are maybe going through the same things. They may have ideas you hadn't thought of. Use them. Everybody wants to help each other. Awesome. Thanks, Caprice. Um, all really great advice. So now, uh, yes, I think there, there will be a list of participants afterwards. And um, we'll also encourage you to join a Facebook group that we have. It's a closed private Facebook group that Spruce Root administers. And it's a way that we hope you can connect with one another and other entrepreneurs in Southeast that have gone through our programs. Um, 